Good morning, everybody. I'm going to give our friends a couple of minutes to join us. Hopefully, you've had a good time experimenting with a marble run. Hello, Jay-Z. Good morning. So this week, we tried something new with Curiosity Corner Live. We tried a week-long challenge, but we have a very special episode for you today. Good morning, Dylan. Have you been making your marble run, Dylan? So we're gonna get started in a couple of minutes. We'd like to give a couple of minutes for friends to join us. Hello, Renee Overstreet. How are you this morning? It's kind of snowing again. Never thought it would snow so many days in a row in, in April. Have you been building your marble run? I had to clear mine off the wall, but I had a lot of fun building that. That was a really great experiment for us. All right, well, we are about to get started. As we were talking about earlier, this week's challenge has been a marble run. And uh, I want you to start thinking about something to add to your marble run, something that's going to help your marble mm, launch through the air and then return safely back to your track. And the reason I want you to add that into your challenge today is because for today's episode of Curiosity Corner Live, we have a very, very special episode. You see, today marks the 50th anniversary of the safe return of the crew on the Apollo 13 mission after an accident in the oxygen tank in the service module forced them to change course. They were supposed to head to the moon, but as the movie made it known there was a really bad accident that fortunately because of a lot of brave men and women they were able to safely return back so today it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you a very special guest from nasa glenn david d felice is a mechanical engineer at nasa glenn and he's going to talk a little bit more about the apollo 13 mission including that accident the accident and investigation and making of the movie, as well as a stay curious moment and a challenge for you to do at home. He's also going to talk a little bit more about the work that they do at NASA Glenn and how they played a role in the Apollo program. Don't forget, as always, you're going to have an opportunity to ask your questions. So make sure that you continue to think about your questions and put them in the comment section, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. So my pleasure to introduce to you our guest from NASA, David D. Police. Good morning, Robin. How are you today? Good morning, David. I'm doing great. How are you this morning? Terrific. Thanks. Great to be with you today. Thanks for inviting me to come on the show. Oh, it's our pleasure. I'm so glad you can join us this morning. So you're going to talk to us a little bit about the Apollo 13 program, as well as a little bit about the movie. Is that right? That's right. Um, it's a great story. Uh, up until, I'd say up until the movie came out in 1995, it was pretty much an untold story. And so now people are more familiar with it. And um, especially the younger generation may not have seen the movie yet. And we've been going through and celebrating the 50th anniversary of each of the missions. Of course, the big one was Apollo 11 uh, last July with the first lunar landing. And as you mentioned, Apollo 13 was supposed to be the third lunar landing. And there's some thoughts, well, things are starting to get routine. Some of the media was losing interest, been there, done that. And uh, so um, things changed in a moment with a flip of a switch. Scary. Scary. Fortunately, it's an ugly story to tell. So I'm going to start this slide. You ready? Absolutely. Let's go. And there it is. So we're talking about Apollo 13. It was an extraordinary rescue. And uh, so again, I'm David D. Felice from the NASA Glenn Research Center. I am a mechanical engineer by education. The past uh, many years, I've actually been working in our uh, community relations uh, office uh, area as uh, the team lead. And it's been my pleasure to be the, the primary interface with uh, Robin and the other folks down at the Great Lake Science Center because they're our official NASA Visitor Center. So when things get back to normal and up and running, the best way to go and learn about um, all things NASA uh, especially uh, related here in Cleveland, is to go down to the Great Lakes Science Center. So I encourage you to do that, especially since they actually have an Apollo Command module and you can see what the real one looks like. So that's kind of a, when all things get back to 
term or if you haven't done a while, check it out. So, um, so the mission uh, with talking about it starts with the crew. And even there, there was a, a late change in it. So Jim Lovell was the commander. This was actually his fourth space flight. He had done two Gemini missions and he did Apollo 8, which was the first mission to actually go out and around the moon and back. They weren't planning to land. It was just, hey, can we do that and get back? And uh, so we're actually working on uh, new missions with a new rocket uh, um, called the Space Launch System with the Orion Space Capsule, which is a lot like the Apollo capsule. And the first mission astronauts will do will be just like Apollo 8, go out to the moon, go around and come back. And then we're hoping in the uh, next four years, we're planning to actually have the, the first woman and the next man put a footprint on the moon. In the middle is uh, Jack Swigert, who was the command module pilot. And uh, he was actually a late addition to the crew. He was originally part of the backup crew but the reason we have backup crews is because they can train and do everything. If something happens, they can step right in and do their job. And something happened, or at least they're afraid it was going to happen. Uh, Ken Mattingly, who was assigned to be the command module pilot, turns out he would, was exposed to the measles. Last thing you want to be is over 200,000 miles away from Earth and break out with the measles. That would not be a good thing. So, And then on the right is Fred Hayes, and uh, he was the lunar module pilot. So the rocket that they used was called the Saturn V rocket. It was the, the biggest rocket and most powerful rocket ever made. And there's a picture of that, that actual launch for the Apollo 13 mission. And the really neat thing about it is when you see the, the rocket launch, you, you'll see uh, um, you know, some of the old original uh, movies and videos, and you might think it's in slow motion, but it's not. It really launched that slowly. Uh, today's rockets, uh, like the space shuttle and now the space launch system, um, use solid rocket boosters, which give a really big kick and get it right up off the launch pad fairly quickly. And uh, that was not the case with this rocket. You, it took a while to get up and get going, even just to clear the tower, much uh, slower. Um, but it was a powerful rocket and everything they needed for the mission was on there to uh, get them out to the moon, land on the moon, get them back safely was there. So it's a, an amazing thing. Unfortunately, I never got to see it launch, but I do hope to see uh, the space launch system rock launch. Um, I did get to see four space shuttle launches. Those are pretty cool. So the spacecraft that we use for Apollo first is the command and service module. So let's we'll pull that up here for you to see. There it is. The command module. Very top, and that's where the crew was, and that was the, the very top of the rocket. So everything below that was all, all designed to get that command module and the crew all the way around the moon back safely. On the right, you can see the lunar module. And so lunar module, what was des designed to actually land on the moon, you see the four feet there and everything. And uh, so that was uh, key. And they were, for most of the mission, they would be docked together. So if you were to take the two and kind of fold them together, the tops of the two in those pictures, they were docked together that way. And there was a docking port and a hatch that could go uh, between them freely. So um, so the next slide actually shows one of the important things that's really important for this mission is the, the command module. Uh, so CSM is command and service module. Uh, so the command module, the, the um, conical shape at the top was designed to have all three crew members. The lunar module was only designed for two crew members because back then we didn't have all the, all the automation. So we wanted to leave the, the command module pilot on board the command module to make sure the two spacecraft could dock again. And uh, so we'll change that a little bit in the difference. But that becomes a big deal later on when all the crew has to go into the lunar module. You got a space and all the systems designed for two people and now there's three people in it. So that was kind of uh, important. So the next slide talks about the accident. So what happened? Robin uh, alluded to it. So the, um, there's oxygen tanks in the service module. Oxygen is what we call a cryogenic liquid. This is the area I worked in for years uh, when I first started at NASA. So it's a super cold liquid. And um, in space, things tend to kind of um, not work, behave the same way as they do on Earth. So one of the things is things could get um, hot spots and cold spots within the tank. They really want to keep things uniformly in there. So they had a method of stirring it. So that was a routine thing to stir the tanks. And typically they would stir the tanks right before they went to sleep so they wouldn't have to wake up and do anything or have an alarm go off. And so right after they did a, uh, a live TV broadcast back to Earth, they said, okay, the TV broadcast is done. A few things for you guys to do before you go to sleep. 
And so they asked you know, Jack Swigert, since the command module pilot, he was the guy in charge, said, why don't you go ahead and stir the tanks? Well, they stirred the tank and then boom, there was a big thud. They had no idea what was going on. They're like, what happened? All we did was stir the tanks. Well, it turned out it actually sparked an explosion. So the picture there was actually kind of a recreation we did here on the ground um, to see what happened in terms of um, what happened and what was this. There was some wire coatings on, you know, you look at any electrical wire that you might see a cord to a lamp or your cord that you might charge an iPhone with or something like that. There's a, some kind of coating on the wire to protect us, to protect everything, uh, to make sure that we don't get electrocuted and things don't get too hot. And we didn't have as much experience as we thought. We thought we had a pretty good grip on, you know, wires in a pure oxygen environment, but there was some kind of a damage, a short and something, and a fire started. And what ended up resulting was an explosion. And uh, later on, I'll show you what that looked. And they didn't really can understand what the uh, ramifications of the explosion were. All they knew is all the alarms, bells and whistles started going off and they realized they were losing oxygen fast. They had to react quickly and figure out First, how do, what would we do to uh, protect the crew? Are they safe? How do we make sure they can get home? So um, part of what they started doing was moving the crew all from the command module over to the lunar module. And they went into, uh, since they were losing the oxygen, also worked for their uh, power system. It's something that's called a, a fuel cell system. Mix hydrogen and oxygen, have a combustion process, generate electricity. Well, they were losing that. So they had a little bit of battery backup power and they had to save that for the one thing, the only thing that um, that had to have, the, the main thing had to have power was the return back to Earth. And they had to save that enough power because you can't return to Earth in the lunar module. You had to do it in the command module. You had enough power to do that. So let's uh, move ahead. And so this is what they saw. This was like right at the, at the end of the mission. So they had to keep everything together as long as they could to make sure they had as much as they need or if there's something they didn't think about. That is what the service module looks like um, it, when it was disconnected from the command module. So it wasn't until they disconnected and can look back at it and they could say, oh my goodness, look at that. There's a whole panel missing. No wonder all those alarms went off, all the bells and whistles. Um, and uh, there was way more damage than they realized. So the damage wasn't just the one tank, but it damaged the other tanks. So um, it was a pretty bad situation. And, and getting pictures like this was really important to try to understand what happened. So there's some other key elements, uh, things to consider. So the key thing is this isn't just about no space mission. It's just about the crew that's in the capsule. Um, there's a, always a team on the ground that makes things happen. And the, the astronauts are always uh, good about commending the team on the ground. So this is a picture in mission control. And mission control is at the what's now called the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston. So that's why when they had a problem, they said, Houston, we've had a problem. That was the call sign uh, for mission control there. So you can see the crew sitting there, sitting down is the famous flight director. His name is Gene Kranz, and he plays a pretty prominent role uh, in the movie. He's the one who's making all the decisions. What do we got to do to get this crew home? Standing around him are other flight directors. Now, when you see a movie, you know, if you, you know, what you don't realize, it seems like these guys are working, you know, around the clock 24 seven. And as a group, they were but they still needed the rest, the crew still needed the rest. So also standing near him is a guy named Glenn Lunny, who was another a lead flight director. And they would work in shifts and take time. They had to stay sharp and keep on their mind. So throughout the rest of the room are the other consoles, the, the life support, the medical officer, uh, they had the public affairs officer who's like um, the job I do. Another astronaut would be what they called CAPCOM, capsule communication. Said so another astronaut talking in astronaut language to his friends up in space telling them what they need to do when things go wrong. But even in, outside of that room, every time they had somebody sitting on a console, there was a whole nother room of people to support that one person at the console, doing extra calculations and doing things. What really makes this amazing is this is before smartphones and calculators. These guys are using slide rules and on the on board the ship, they're using pencils and paper, double checking and writing down figures they couldn't you know, um, communicate everything as easily, you just upload and download things the way we do freely. They're actually reading coordinates to them over the phone. So you get a real good feel for that uh, throughout the process. All right, so moving forward, I want to explain to you uh, some other things. So one of the critical elements, remember I said, the lunar module designed for two people and they're already gonna be in there a couple days. They go in there, 
they'd undock, go down to the lunar surface, spend, you know, for the Apollo 11 crew, it was a couple hours, and each crew, the plan was to have them stay a little bit longer, but we're talking a day or two is all they were, it was designed to do. And so when you put three people in there for the majority of the length of the mission, one of the problems they had was their, their, their air was getting contaminated with their own breath. We breathe in fresh air, which is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. And <clears throat> excuse me, when you breathe out, it's mostly nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. So what we do is we have a system to scrub the uh, carbon dioxide out of the system. But with three guys in there for an extended period of time, it's just kind of like another filter that would get clogged or used up. Like if you have a water filter at home, you have to change them every so often that it changed the filter. So the first thought is, well, we'll just go over the command module. We'll grab the carbon dioxide filter from over there. We'll bring it over here. Well, the problem is they had two different companies building the scrubbers and they didn't have a common set of standards. So you couldn't just plug one into the other. And so there's a, a fairly famous scene in the movie and this shows the, the actual crew doing this. They, so the, basically they had to do the proverbial, put a square peg in a round hole, but they can only do it with the materials they had on board. They're using duct tape, um, cardboard from like their um, flight instructions, those types of things. And they had to work it all out on the ground. They were, you know, dumped out all the materials, said, this is what we got to work with. Let's figure out a plan and then send it up to them over the radio and have them do it. And the great thing was, is it worked. They're able to do it. They followed the instructions to the T. And shortly after they started seeing the carbon dioxide levels come back down. And that was uh, critical for them. There was many, many more issues they had to deal with over time. Um, Fred Hayes um, started getting uh, some symptoms of some sickness and some different things like that. They, this, this was perilous. There's nothing you could do in a movie or whatever else to over-dramatize um, the nature of the danger. Now, maybe the explosion seemed a little more extreme than maybe it was in, in reality, but uh, overall, a very good accounting of it. So another key element of the whole mission and some decisions they had to make quickly was to get them home safely with a crippled command module because the command module, excuse me, yeah, service module had the propulsion system, the rocket engines they needed to get home. So they couldn't use that. Yeah, so they had to use, do something and lots of things, just like building that carbon dioxide scrubber, you had to figure out, so if something wasn't designed to do something, can we get it to do what we needed to do in this emergency situation? So they were able to use the rockets that were helping the that were designed to help the lunar module land safely on the moon, safely and softly, and fire those to change the course of the mission because they were already on a course that would have them be go into the Earth, the lunar orbit, be captured by the gravity, and then go into orbit. So the other trajectory, if we can pull that up large again so people can see it, is called a free return. And so they had to fire the engines to get them going. So they go on a wider pass around the moon, kind of get slingshotted around. And so they didn't have to be constantly firing their engines, just let physics kind of take its work, but you still got to keep everything uh, pointed in the right direction, fire the engines for just the right amount of time uh, at the right time to get it going, keep things pointed in the right direction. Okay, let's move forward. So how do you do that? We don't, they didn't have all the extensive navigation systems on the lunar module because it's really just designed to do one landing and then one docking again with the, the module. So the command module had all the more sophisticated navigation systems. They didn't have that. So they had to actually use some old techniques um, from more um, primitive days. And the actual one, so for all the bad luck they had on this mission, if you want to call it bad luck or a series of unfortunate circumstances, there was also some fortunate circumstances that worked out of it. One of which is, remember, I said Jim Lovell was on the Apollo 8 mission, and that was one of the uh, uh, that was the first mission to go around the moon. So they basically took a mission profile from Apollo 8. Let's just go around the moon and get back safely. So they had this technique kind of worked out that they had never tried before, where they would point the rocket and look at a certain spot on the moon. So on the slide, you can see a picture of the Earth, what it looks like from the moon. This is a, an actual picture from the Apollo 13 movie. Uh, from the Apollo 13 mission, excuse me. And in the movie and in the, some of the documentaries you have, you can see they're talking about how do they point it. They reference something called the Terminator. So this is the Terminator from Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is a place, and so it's basically that line that separates uh, daylight and sunlight on the Earth. So it gives them a fixed point of reference that they can point to. And so they use that. So while they were firing the, the engines, 
Um, each one had a different role. Somebody was firing the main engines. Somebody was c controlling which way they're pointing. There's uh, what they call um, pitch and roll and yaw. So they're trying to keep the, everything pointed while they're firing the rockets in, and they're visually looking at the terminator of it. So I uh, hope uh, next time you um, see something, uh, you can understand a little better. This is what they were trying to do. Okay. And so when it all came together, it was a successful mission in terms of getting them home. And that was the most important thing. The, always the most important part of the mission is getting them home safely. In fact, um, you know, when President Kennedy gave his initial charge to send a man to the moon and return him safely, we don't want to just send somebody out there. Some people are talking about, we'll just send people out to Mars and we won't bring them back. NASA would never do that. We always want to bring the people home uh, uh, safely. We don't do one-way trips. We do round trips. And so that's the crew. They're back on uh, the Navy aircraft carrier uh, that uh, they recovered. And the whole world was glued to their TV sets. Newspaper headlines were talking about the crew and uh, the great peril that were, they were in, the danger that they were in, and how they get them back safely. So um, that's it. And so I want to do is mention, we just did a TV special uh, for NASA. On uh, We have our own channel called NASA Television, but we also have YouTube and other things. So if you go to uh, NASA's YouTube channel, or if you just go in a, a search engine on the, on the internet and search Apollo 13 Home Safe, this is a great 30-minute documentary. It's got a lot of the original footage, and it's got commentary from the crew of the ship. So two of the uh, crew members are still with us, Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes. And then some of the people I mentioned in Mission Control, like um, uh, Gene Kranz and uh, Glenn Lunny, are still alive. And we have their comments and their perspectives looking back uh, 50 years on this. So the, the overall message that we have moving forward as we talk about um, you know, our new space launch system in Orion is space is hard. Space travel is hard. It takes hard work and dedication. It takes a full team of people on the ground. So um, we hope that uh, you're continuing to work um, hard on um, your schoolwork to the extent you still have it at home. These science challenges that Robin and her team have been sharing with you Great ways to pick up new knowledge, new skills, see how things come together, and the uh, important to keep the learning going. So, uh, why don't we stop there, Robin, and see if uh, any questions or uh, some other things we can talk about? That was awesome, Dave. Yeah, that was awesome. I really appreciate you sharing that story, and and more importantly, talking about the historical significance and the group of people that worked together to bring those men safely home to Earth. So I really appreciate that. Um, somebody had asked a question about the big blue thing, and I'm not exactly certain what that question is referring to. I don't know if uh, if you can connect those dots. <laughs> Not often, just the big blue thing was the earth. That's the only thing I saw was big and blue. But uh, if somebody wants to clarify, or we can go go back if we have time at the end. And, uh, sure. Yeah. So we'll definitely have an opportunity at the end to answer your question. So make sure you keep commenting in the comment section. And uh, we're going to pull those questions back up. So think about your questions. Make sure you post them. Um, meanwhile, David, you had talked a little bit about the movie. And the movie was really important because mm -hmm. it connected what was happening with pretty much the entire world. And so I'm wondering if you have a couple minutes, if you'd be willing to share a little bit more about the making of the movie. Sure. Um, I, I gave you a couple slides hoping we'd have some time. So why don't we go ahead and go to those. And, um, you know, the nice thing that I really appreciate a, a, about a, a movie is when you can, um, we know how it's going to end, but it still has you on the edge of your seat and you're, you're still kind of excited to see what happens and how it works out. And it also gives you a really good feel for, you know, these are real people with families and um, challenges and fears and how they overcome them. And um, I love a quote from uh, John Glenn, obviously, with the Glenn Research Center. At one point, somebody asked him, you know, gee, you know, Senator Glenn, Colonel Glenn, um, you must have been fearless. And he says, I wasn't fearless. I was courageous. I knew what the fear was and I, I knew what the reasonable risks were and I had the courage to persevere. And persevere is the name of our new Mars rover. So we're, uh, you know, like to talk about that as well. So let's talk a little bit about the making of the movie Apollo 13. And a lot, a lot of folks at NASA had a role in that. Let's go ahead and um, see if we can get the next slide to go forward here. Technology. There we go. So at NASA, we, we try to help Hollywood, you know, tell these great stories whenever uh, it's possible. We get a chance to look at the script and make sure it's going to be accurate, try to do, you know, technical accuracy. Not always people listen to us, but uh, in this case, they really listen. And actually, the movie was based on a book 
um, co-authored by Jim Lovell. Uh, it's called Lost Moon. And so, and they had consultants who were helping them all along the way, make sure the movie was told accurately. So since the, uh, the 1990s, NASA has actually worked with Hollywood producers and to provide the technical expertise and uh, help them tell the story as accurately as possible and as visually um, accurate as, as possible as well. So for this movie, we actually had some unique opportunities. So early on, the, the, the movie maker said, hey, we're gonna film this movie, we're gonna try to simulate what it's like to be in weightlessness. Could we ride on, on your airplane? It's a, a KC-135. Oops, all right. I have a little issue, I had a little flicker here. So uh, a KC-135 aircraft and uh, with nothing in the middle of it, there's an airplane that the Air Force normally uses for um, refueling airplanes and all. And so we affectionately call this aircraft a vomit comet because it gives you a sense of weightlessness and that can be really upsetting to uh, a lot of people's stomachs. So the producer asked NASA, hey, can we go on like just a familiarization flight? We just want to let our actors and our crew know what would it be like to feel weightless? And they, they, they did that. And the experience was so amazing. They said, can we actually build a set, a movie set inside your airplane and shoot some of the scenes in weightlessness? And that's exactly what they did. So the picture you see on the bottom there is inside the aircraft. And you can see some of the crew members in position and the cameramen and the people all working around that. So when you see scenes from the movie, that look like they're weightless, that's not visual effects. That was actually several scenes were shot in weightlessness. And we have a couple of samples to uh, show you. And I think we're gonna start by having Tom Hanks himself, he's the one who played Jim Lovell, explain what happened, how this looked like as a uh, train. Let's go ahead. Turn up your volume if you can't hear it. Robin, I can't hear it. I'm just letting you know. Hopefully you guys can all hear it. Oh, very good. So I um, hope you guys can all hear that real well. Um, so Tom Hanks explaining that and uh, pretty, pretty amazing experience. So, um, so that's what it all, you know, looked like and how they talked about how you actually created this weightlessness. And it's actually real similar. He talked about, you know, it's almost like going on a roller coaster, but instead of it lasting only, you know, a couple of seconds and an instantaneous feeling, you actually you would experience it for 20, 25 seconds. And when you're making a movie, that's kind of the way movies go anyway. They're always kind of changing scenes, changing camera angles, uh, those types of things. So it actually uh, lend itself real well. It wasn't seem like, oh, this seems so choppy and, and broken up. So th they uh, did a great job that way. All right, so this next one um, actually shows a still image from this scene. I don't think we have this uh, video clip uh, working right now. But um, the, um, there's a juice bag. So when astronauts drink, they can't use a cup because the liquid just kind of would creep and crawl right out of it and spill and make a mess. So in here in a juice bag, there's for the camera, they're actually squeezing the juice bag and you can see how little droplets come floating out and around. And you can, if your aim is good, you could squeeze the juice bag and just kind of go up and just kind of you know, suck it up without a straw. Typically they use straws, but sometimes they would do some fun things that way and try not to make a mess. The next slide should hopefully have a video associated with it. And this was actually part of the, the TV show that they, uh, the live broadcast back to earth. And you can see, look at, look at the weight, the uh, radio that uh, Fred Hayes has. Let's go ahead and play that. So that's pretty cool. So that was not something they were doing with tricks and wires and you know whatever else. 
that they were actually in the KC-135 aircraft spinning the radio around and doing those things. So that's pretty cool. So um, it's amazing what we can do in working uh, those kinds of uh, things together. So I hope that you find that interesting and gives you a great appreciation. One of the things I've always said about the movie is I'm so glad it was made in 19, uh, you know, it, it, the movie was made in 1995 when we did that, but I'm so glad we actually did the Apollo missions in the late 1960s and early 1970s because otherwise people would think, oh, you didn't do that. We just That was just Hollywood and whatever else. Some people who are not very smart say things like that already anyway, but so. That was fun. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, David, as we mentioned, the name of this new program is called Stay Curious, Curiosity Corner. And so I'm wondering if you have any of those, uh, you know, curious moments that you'd like to share with us. We do. So I had, I, I kind of figured since that was the name of the, the program, Curiosity Corner Live, I prepared a few curious facts to share with everyone here. And so did you know, for example, that Jim Lovell was actually born in Cleveland, Ohio. In fact, his family at the time was living in Parma, a city called Parma. It's one of our suburbs here. And there's a park called Lovell Park in Parma. And then Fred Hayes, he actually began his career uh, with NASA here in Cleveland. Back then it was called the Lewis Research Center, but today it's what we call the NASA Glenn Research Center. And he was a research uh, pilot on it. And if we go to the, a little forward to see one of the airplanes he flew, um, the, uh, the AJ-2. And really neat, the kind of how funny things come around and all that way. One of the things Fred worked on is he pioneered the use of research uh, using aircraft to create weightlessness. In the top picture there, that's actually a picture of Fred Hayes in the inside of that plane, looking at how they could get this object, this test package floating around and such that way. So it's amazing that this research that was done in the late 1950s was used to make a movie you know, uh, some 40 years later using weightlessness. And that's just, I just think that's an amazing, you know, little kind of fun fact there. And I think I've got a couple more. So did you know that NASA Glenn, we had our own vomit comet in the mid 1990s. And if you look at this photo real careful, the guy all the way on the left, that's actually a much younger version of me. And this was really about the same time. This I think was in 1996, so a year after the movie was made. So in my, my job, we work with the uh, uh, people who are in the media, TV reporters and cameramen. So from time to time, so they could help tell the story about what we do, how we use weightlessness to advance science and to test things before we would send them up on the space shuttle or the space station. We would fly with them and somebody from our office had to go with them and escort them. And I was like, I'll go. And so I got to go. And uh, I can say it was a bit of a gut-wrenching experience for me. And I think we have, um, you know, uh, Robin, I think we should, uh, we should talk about giving the, everyone a, a chance to do something at home. Yeah, what do you have for us? Okay, so one of the cool things that we have, so we actually have an overall program called NASA at Home. And so it's a website that lists all kinds of things. One of the sections on that is called Virtual Tours. And the folks I work with and uh, some of my teammates, actually my office mate was a key person. I'm putting together a series of 11 virtual tours. So I wanna show everyone one of them. And that's so um, some of the research that we did at the end uh, after the Apollo mission, whenever something goes wrong, we wanna understand what happened wrong. So we actually, I saw you that showed you the earlier picture of um, testing some flames in an oxygen tank. <clears throat> so we actually did that in a facility called the Zero Gravity Facility, 500 foot hole in the ground that we have here that can create weightlessness for five seconds. So we wanted to see, so the picture I showed you first was another test that was done just in regular gravity, a normal gravity situation. So we wanted to see what would happen in a weightless environment. How would the frame, could the flame ignite? How would the flame move through the wire? Those types of things in a weightless environment. So we did that test. So, um, we actually use that to, to test uh, the flammability of the coated wires in an oxygen tank in weightlessness. But did you know you can actually take a virtual tour of the zero gravity facility? The next picture shows that you can actually go online and I think we can post for you in the, uh, the comments section. Oh, there it is right there, nice and big and easy to see. www.nasa.gov slash Glenn virtual tours. You'll see all 11 listed. So the one that connects mostly to what we're talking about today is the zero gravity facility. 
you can go on it, you can click on it, you can use a smartphone, you can use a computer and move the mouse controls and everything. I believe on our Facebook page and some other platforms, there's a video there that is a quick kind of how-to video. Um, so you can do that. It's kind of the next best thing to being there. And hopefully, um, pretty soon we'll be able to start doing in-person tours again. We do tours once a month of a facility. And usually every year, we have at least one tour of the zero gravity facility. And uh, you can actually take that and go in it, take a look down into that 500 foot uh, hole in the ground. Um, there are some so the security restrictions and limitations that you need to be sensitive to, but you can find that on our website, www.nasa.gov slash Glenn, I believe take you right there to that. So that's a great activity to go home, Robin. I don't know if you've had a chance to do that yet, but that's uh, really amazing. It's like being there. That's awesome. I can't wait to do it. All okay. right. So I'm going to scroll through and see if there are any questions. So if you've not already, David, thank you so much. I really do appreciate this. And I think that it is really important to remember that NASA is working actively. In fact, you work at NASA Glenn. Uh, we are Great Lakes Science Center, home of one of only 11 NASA visitor centers in the country. So it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be able to partner with NASA Research Center and to bring these these types of experiences to our guests and friends of the Great Lakes Science Center. So thank you again. I'm going to scroll through and see if there's any other questions. I think I saw one about oh, how was NASA involved um, in Apollo or Apollo 13. We talked a little bit about the accident investigation and um, in the Apollo missions in general, we played a really big role, a lot of the technology. So um, the, the rockets use, uh, um, I mentioned like the cryogenic fuels, like liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And so we were the ones here in Cleveland actually kind of really developed and refined that technology, did some of the critical testing. And we couldn't have done the Apollo missions without the hydrogen and oxygen propulsion technology. And that's a pretty big deal. But power systems, we did wind tunnel testing um, because, you know, the rockets have to fly through the air to get up into space. So it's important and we have to look at things like emergency exits and the return and those types of things. So uh, you can go on our website and you'll see more stories and uh, more details about the accident investigation, more information about our contributions to Apollo in general. Uh, that site that's up there now, kind of all the stuff, kind of everything Apollo 13 is kind of tied into there. So I think we can hopefully, uh, that's a long URL to type, so hopefully we can share that in the yeah. comments for the live stream as well. So you don't have to try to type all Yeah, that. we'll definitely have those links available to everybody. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of um, green-faced emojis, which, David, I think that you can sort of uh, speculate what those emojis were in reference to as part of your presentation. Yes, I did mention as a gut-wrenching experience. And, well, um, I've, I've always said I'm kind of, I don't know either brave enough or dumb enough to do anything once. So I'm actually someone who gets sick on roller coaster rides and all that. And this going on the vomit comet was really the ultimate roller coaster. So I went to see one of the NASA doctors to kind of do a pre-check physical, make sure you're okay. And he gave me these two tiny little pills. And I'm like, that's it? He goes, oh, you'll be amazed at how well they work. I was not amazed at how well they work. I, maybe they're so small, they, 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 between my hand and my mouth, maybe they missed or something. They didn't do anything. So do you think your audience wants to see a picture of me on the vomit comment? You know, it's possible. Uh, let's let's pull that up. I also do, while I'm pulling that up, Dylan had asked about what his challenge was, and he wanted to know if his challenge is to watch the movie. And Dylan, I definitely think that it would be a good experience to watch the movie. But don't forget that Marble Run is also a challenge. We introduced that early on when I was uh, before David came to join us this morning. So adding something to your Marble Run, as well as the challenge that David had talked about with gravity. So let me pull up a couple more photos, David. Yeah, and the, yeah, the challenge is to, to go on, do a virtual tour. If you need some help from uh, uh, a parent, an adult, someone uh, to do that, the virtual tour is pretty cool. You don't need any special goggles or glasses or anything. You just need a computer or a smartphone, and uh, you can go through that. So uh, check it out. And if you have any questions about that, um, there's the URL again for that, Glenn Virtual Tours. Um, you can post comments on our, our social channel. Oh, there's the photo. Hopefully, I don't regret this, but... So, yeah, sitting down on the ground, that's me with the proverbial barf bag. And so, Robin, what do you think? Um, so we usually do about 25 parabolas or more going over till we go, you know, as Tom, talk, Tom Hanks talked about, you dive down, you go up, pull over about 25 times. 
how many parabolas, what parabola do you think I first got sick on? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, there you are. Well, yeah, let me guess. Um, 25 parabolas, I'm going to say 24. Number two. The second parabola. So for the rest of the <laughs> flight, I'm like, so actually what I had to do, if you can go back to that picture again, I can show you. Um, you can actually see, I'm pretty sure that one was taken in weightlessness. You can see some of the folks with me. Those are some of our media representatives. You look, you'll see uh, my feet are actually tucked underneath a red strap. This was so I wouldn't, you know, you don't float up on control, but you can see the other people. They're kind of floating around and all that. And uh, so, yeah, number two. So I actually moved to the back of the airplane, sat in the seat. But I kept my wits about me. I had a water bottle just to keep, you know, things refreshed. I could grab a drink of water. And I was actually looking at it because this is the area that I worked in as an engineer. How do we manage fluids in on a low gravity environment? So I could actually see. So when you have a, a water bottle, and unfortunately, I don't have one that's uh, uh, clear right now. But all the water sits on the bottom normally. So when you're in weightlessness, the water coats the outside of the tank and you get a bubble, not at the top. You get it in the middle. So I have my water bottle. I'm kind of checking out. So wow, that's cool. I can actually see it. And I was very glad when the airplane landed, though. But I'm also very glad I did the experience. So even if you have a challenging experience, an opportunity that's safe, you know, don't want to encourage anybody to do anything that's not safe or anything. But you get the opportunity to do something unique. Encourage you to do it, even if you think, ah, eh, I might get a little sick. You get over it. So. Another question? Robin, I can't hear you, just let you know. So if you have a question for me. So this is the image that uh, prompted the question about the big blue thing on oh, the ground the is that, blue. yeah. So this yeah. was Shana or Dylan had asked the question of the big blue thing. This is what they were referring to. Okay, so I don't know exactly, but my guess is that was like a shipping container or something. My guess is, um, that the command module, the service module sat down inside of that. And that was to protect the red engine on in the bottom. So when we move things around, um, we have to put protective equipment around it. We call it ground support equipment. And usually they're a bright color like blue or yellow and there's markings on it says, yeah, don't put this on the rocket. This is just to protect it until we get there. So my guess is it's something uh, along those lines. That's a good question. Your observant eyes there, and you can see the people, how small they are compared to, you know, uh, some of that equipment there. That's awesome, David. Well, I'm not seeing any additional questions. However, for those of you that are at home, if you do have questions, feel free to share them with us. Remember, we're going to post a follow-up video at three o'clock tonight, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what we have in store for you this weekend with Curiosity Corner Live. David, thank you so much. I really do appreciate all that information and uh, really appreciate you spending the morning with us. Uh, my pleasure. Now, my, my understanding, too, is this is live, but you'll this will be available on YouTube later. So if people really like it, they can tell their friends, come on back. You can share the link with them and see it. And uh, they won't be able to ask questions in real time, but you can ask questions on the Great Lakes Science Center um, uh, social media channels or on the NASA Glenn Research Center. And we'll do our best to get back to you with a question. Rob you can always forward questions to me. We'll try to get back to you that way. So. Oh, there it is. There's a link right there. I'm sure we can uh, cut and paste that put it into the comments as well. Share that with friends and family and uh, have them kind of you know, <clears throat> tell them they missed it and they should come back for another Curiosity Corner Live, right? Absolutely. All right, David. Well, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you this morning. Thanks, Robin. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. All right, everybody, thank you so much. That's it for this episode of Curiosity Corner Live. Don't forget to tune in every day at 10.30. We post a follow-up at 3 p.m. If you've not already subscribed to this channel, be sure to subscribe and head over to our website, greatscience.com, for more information and for how you can stay curious at home. I'll see you next time.